Welcome to Motivated to Lead Podcast, helping you become a better leader. I'm your host, Mark Klingsein. Hi, everyone. Thanks again for joining us for our podcast this week. My name is Mark Klingsheim with SEMA Partners. Each week, we interview leaders and they share lessons learned from their careers. Our goal is to help you become a better leader. This week, we're going to revisit a conversation that we had uh, early on in our podcast uh, with, uh, with Byron Laughlin. Uh, Byron is uh, currently the global head of NASDAQ and board advisory and the NASDAQ Center for Board Excellence. Uh, he was the uh, founder of the Center for Board Excellence, which was purchased by uh, NASDAQ. Uh, he's seen as an expert in the area of board governance, and he's worked with uh, companies globally. Uh, he has been a CEO and uh, has served on a number of boards. And we're looking forward to his insights and our conversation today with Byron. Byron, can you first off give us just a little bit of your your background and uh, kind of an overview of your career? Sure, happy to do that. I started uh, I started in politics. I worked in the congressional cycle of eighty three, eighty four out of college back when for the National Republican uh, Congressional Committee for two years. I was really just looking for a job, and and my congressman in Michigan happened to be a Republican, and back then. Um, unlike today, there was great camaraderie between Republicans and Democrats because sure. I ended up doing some work with with actually Tip O'Neill and his crowd a bit back then. So my first indoctrination into leadership at that kind of level was uh, working on consensus and working together and advancing the greater good. Uh, after that, I got involved in a uh, leadership uh, institute in DC that helped uh, promote internships internationally that would place interns in places like uh, uh, offices on Capitol Hill and embassies. I did that for five years and, and that was very rewarding as a young person. I did that in my mid 20s um, to build relationships with people from around the world that were coming to learn and some of them from, from less developed countries really coming to learn about our system of government and business. And then I spent 25 years in finance and in business and ultimately ending that part of my career as the CEO of uh, investment and development uh, and home building company that was sold uh, in 2007 with no magic prior to the financial crisis and no magic, <laughs> no crystal balls there. And then that. So I had a year, year, almost two years to kind of think about what I wanted to do next, but I knew it was in the area of leadership. Mm. And I had a hunch that it was in the area of working with boards at the higher level because I had gone back to Harvard Business School to their three-year executive program uh, to, to learn more about leadership and, and leadership strategy. And that started the ball rolling in 2002 that led to me starting uh, this company in 2010. Great. So your interest in leadership, you've seen it in different uh, different sectors on the government side as well yeah. as in, in business. But uh, tell me a little bit more about kind of your motivation for starting uh, the, the Center for Board Excellence. Well, I, I believe that leaders... And I subscribe to the notion that leaders really want to move on an ongoing basis from good to great. And, and that's a dynamic, ongoing function. And I, I don't believe that any of us ever arrive at sort of that pinnacle, as Jim Collins calls it, the level five leadership um, that, is, that is, in a sense, at an end of our leadership experience. It's more an ongoing dynamic. And in seeing that uh, and learning about great leaders that had, that had developed both within companies and other places, but I'm going to focus today entirely on companies because that's where our focus and our energy is, is um, largely given to organizations that want to improve their board and the relationship between the board and management. Mm -hmm. And so I, I saw that there was a missing piece, 
a professor friend of mine at Harvard, uh, Jay Lorsch, had indicated that really boards were underperforming in the in the thousands, 2000 through 2010. And when you see something that's underperforming, it also means there's an opportunity of some sort. Sure. And so I thought maybe there's an opportunity for a business here and to be able to in a sense double down on my desire to see great leadership advanced and to be a part of assessing what does how do we determine what board effectiveness is and how do we better uh, delineate and define this notion of board effectiveness. It's, it's a word that, it's a phrase that's used often and particularly the word effectiveness, but it wasn't well defined before. And even governance was less defined. This is something that's happened in the last four or five years to a much greater degree. And so that's, that really was the catalyst to get the Center for Board Excellence going. And what we found, I'll just fast forward for you and your listeners, that it is something that is highly desirable by many board members and board leaders. And it was a missing link in our global society of business and board leaders. Mm. So talk to me a little bit about the the effectiveness side. You know, I think there's probably, and you've probably run into that there's probably a lot of viewpoints around that, but kind of as a, as an organization working with uh, boards and CEOs, uh, how would you define kind of on a high level uh, what an effective board looks like? I, I, I look at it both for the, for the group and for the individual, what we focus in on our five um, key attributes, the intellectual, the emotional, the spiritual, the innovative, and the relational. And I'll go through those quickly. The intellectual has to do with those elements of knowing the business, knowing the science, how to read a balance sheet. And I'm describing if you're a board member or a leader, the things that you want to develop is the ability to whatever you're your area of strength is to build upon that in the area of the intellectual so that you can understand risk better, can understand finance better. How does your product differentiate itself in the marketplace? What difference does it make to the end users, whoever that is, to the stakeholders, and ultimately to your shareholders also, they're a key part of the stakeholder group. If I use the word stakeholder, I don't want anyone out there to think I'm negating at all the shareholder and return on investment because I strongly believe in a capitalism for more people than for less. I'm not going to um, mitigate the need for expanded capitalism. We just need to do it in a more effective way. And, and therefore, the other areas that are key, the emotional has to do with how we, how we present ourselves and how we read others. What is our self-awareness level when we go into a given situation? If you're in sales, if you're working in an office environment where you're interacting with others, how are you coming across to the other people? And there's great resources out there like um, Strength Finders and DISC and, and uh, uh, Myers-Briggs and all these kinds of things that I think are terrific, frankly. And we study those here in our in our psychometrics at, C, at CBE. And then the spiritual, I, I, and I want to emphasize to people, regardless of your religious viewpoint, we all believe in something. I loved a concert I went to years ago, Bob Dylan, before he, you know, he would light up a song, before he lit up the song, he said, if you don't stand for something, you'll fall for anything. <laughs> and I think that if you don't believe in something, then, then you've got confusion in your life. So, but, but it really comes down to what are the core values of your company and what does your company represent in the marketplace? And then we're all in the innovation business today in one way or another. Here we are at CBE. We are a technology company first and foremost. What we introduced in 2010 was a technology by which uh, people could use to assess 
the quality of their board effectiveness and their relationship with management. And the last of that, how all this comes together in a relationology. I have a friend in England named Matt Bird. He has a company called relationology.co.uk. I thought that was such a terrific idea to come up with about the relation. Nobody had ever used this term before, which amazed me, that the relationology of an organization, what is its what is studying the organization? How does how do the people all relate together, which goes straight to this notion of culture? And then uh, something I want us to get into is why does culture eat strategy? One of the famous Peter Drucker quotes. Right. And uh, and so that's that's the approach that we have and have found to be very successful and desirable by boards to really understand how they relate to one another in these five areas. Yeah. So let's let's jump into that uh, the topic that you you raised regarding that uh, culture eats strategy. Uh, tell me a little bit about your thoughts around that as you've uh, worked with with companies. Well, I think that uh, what I've observed, and much of this, are, you know, I'm in the fortunate position to be observing companies. We work with companies from Fortune 20 level companies up all the way through not for profit organizations because mm-hmm. we look at board members hopefully when they walk into the boardroom or when they pick up their board book and are reading it, that they're doing it with the same mission and intent, regardless of if it's a fortune 100 company or if it's a not-for-profit in the local community, that there's a similar mission driven element to that. And so within that, you, you have a tone within a company or a, or a culture. And it's kind of like the air we breathe. And if that air is toxic, it, it really doesn't matter how good your strategy is. It will eventually destroy the organization. If we look at what Uber did, Uber saw the potential for an, a toxic culture forming, and they corrected it very quickly. And now apparently there's an improving culture. Um, you know, we all get off our rails a little bit here or there, and they were they were uh, losing their way a bit. But it's good to see companies correct their behavior and move forward. So I, I, you know, in another current one, we would all hope. I hope that that uh, Elon Musk is a huge winner. But if he were listening to this podcast, I'd say, Elon, please get with your board if you're not already and talk with them and ask them questions about mentorship and how you can be the most effective and and win for all of us in civilization. I mean, the guy's brilliant and doing hopefully great things, but he he does some things that (laughs) he did some things there for a while that are questioned. Fortunately, I haven't heard as much from that. And, And those are just large examples of how I think a culture could be injured very rapidly if the leadership isn't taking note of how that affects the lives of all stakeholders. So you mentioned the the idea that culture eats strategy. Uh, so that strategy is important for a company. How does that sure. play as far as kind of, and how is strategy misunderstood? That strategy is how you are different. Mm-hmm. How do we, what makes our product special? And why does somebody want that product? And why should it grow? And answering those questions, I think, are, are key to the orientation of what is strategic and what is strategy. And if the culture is not supporting the notion of that growth, if we eventually find out today, I mean, one of the great differentiators today of uh, holding culture accountable is social media. So we have things like Glassdoor, and we even have, you can even read things on Facebook or Twitter about a company. And I mean, we want to be careful because there can always be a disgruntled person who just has an ax to grind that is possibly even wrong in their, their assessment of a situation. But if, if I went to Glassdoor and I read 500, uh, descriptions of the culture of a company that were all similarly consistent that expressed concern about what was going on. I think you, we, we generally would recognize that there's probably a problem in that company. And 
if they haven't started addressing it already, then I think that that culture is going to eat that strategy, no matter how successful it is. And, uh, you know, they may sell the company because they can't fix the culture. And the next, the buyer may be the fixer, but um, they'll probably sell it for 2% or 50% of the actual value sure. of the company. Assuming it was a very popular product. I mean, I'm kind of looking at it how, how great products um, fail toxically. I mean, it, American Apparel was an example of that several years ago. They ended up having a, they, they were on almost every street corner in, uh, in some of the large cities of America. And now you can't find one because of a toxic culture. Interesting. So talking about, you know, a company has a strategy to acquire, you know, customers. Uh, mm -hmm. But, you know, that whole idea as far as I think there are some companies that go every over uh, after each uh, customer thinking that they're equal, uh, but uh, sometimes compromise their their overall mission. Uh, talk about that as far as kind of the, the customer acquisition and, and the importance of picking, uh, focusing on the right customers. This is a uh, area where uh, I try to spend a lot of time um, learning, and that is in the area of, of uh, customer selection. Because naturally, in our business, if somebody came to us and wanted us to help them fix some element of their board, um, we would want to partner with them and help in that area. But if they want us to sort of check the box so they can look like they've got a good housekeeping seal on the door, but inside the building is toxicity, then we want to be careful to learn and discern what is a, what is a great product. And in our area, the great product is a partnership with a board that does desire uh, excellent leadership and an excellent culture in their organization. So customer selection, I think, though, in any business is, is key and I, I would, even down through a, a not-for-profit organization, I would suggest you want to be careful who you select as a customer and who you, want, you desire as a donor, because mm -hmm. there could be unintended consequences come along with that uh, customer. And, uh, and so I think the customer selection process is one that should be thought through through a series of questions at the leadership level. Who are we really trying to serve? How do we do it most effectively? And are there customers, are there unintended con uh, consequences that we could encounter through a customer relationship that would be undesirable for the long-term benefit of the organization? That's an, that's an interesting point. I think everybody looks at, especially in the nonprofit world, you get a donor and you want all the donors you can get. But I, th I think you're right. You can you can definitely compromise uh, your values depending mm -hmm. on who, who that donor, major donor is. So talk to me about um, some advice that you would give to, there's some new executives, uh, leaders that are maybe in their first CEO role. Uh, they've mm -hmm. not been in that uh, position to work with a board, what advice would you give uh, a new executive? So in going through, going back through the, the, the five items I listed before, it's um, initiate a relationship with the board chair or some sort of lead position on the board. If it's a small private company, um, the CEO and chair could quite likely be the same person. Mm -hmm. But think of the board as a partner and even as a peer mentor type relationship as a you i would hope that a board in a private environment would have that kind of trusted advisor and are you willing to really hear what they have to say about the accountability structure of the organization because as a ceo demonstrates their ability to be accountable their the organization is going to sense some of this culturally down through the organization and have a similar approach to accountability. I think that, it, that to use the term, interestingly, um, that could be toxic in a positive manner, or it could be viral is the, is the better term that we use today. In a viral manner, uh, the notion of being accountable for excellence in an organization is set as a tone from the top. So if the somehow, without 
inappropriately disclosing too much because there's decorum in, and there's a balance of how much we disclose and in, in, in all we do in our relationships with others. That the relationship between the CEO and sometimes between a few members of the management team and the board is key for the for all the stakeholders to have a sense they're doing their job well. They care about what we care about. And hopefully that's great product, profitability, success, and a great stakeholder customer relationship. And and so I think that one of the one of the areas that we often ask the question if you were charged with being a coach or mentor in a given situation, say with a fellow board member or between a chair and a CEO, how would you coach this person to improve professionally over the next year? I think that's a good question, whether or not we are, I mean, shift back to the, the notion of Jim Collins, good to great. The differentiator was strength of will and humility. And I think the humility function is, is volunteering to be accountable. I don't think one is accountable unless they volunteer to be that way. And I think that really shows a tremendous strength of character for someone to invite accountability. What advice would you give that person kind of moving into more of a uh, tension-filled environment? Well, that's going to be a challenge. I, I would also, um, I mean, realistically, if this is in most business and even some not-for-profit environments, you want to have some sort of legal resource. And when I say that, someone with legal experience is usually in any business or not-for-profit area. There's usually a friend or a lawyer that's, that's nearby that you can... You, Depending on the exact situation, you, you may need to retain this person more as a consultant than as a, quote, lawyer right. and, and get good legal advice on how to proceed. And when I say good legal advice on how to proceed, I've, I have in, in my set of relationships, I have several lawyers who provide professional advice to, to me and to us that are being paid to do that in some way, but it's not so much lawyering as it is good justice advice, I might call it. What is a just way to deal with a contentious situation? And how do we resolve this with the least amount of damage to the organization? And we find settlements or relationship building exercises in which um, we, we mitigate the risk. Um, because the situation you're describing, let's assume for a minute, there's no you know, Shangri-La kind of outcome. This right. isn't, everybody's not gonna be happy in the end. So it's, it's getting to a resolution that is acceptable for all, all parties. At, at, um, probably at every business school in any environment, but we spent a lot of time at Harvard talking about our ZOPA, the zone of possible agreement, and, you've, and then your BATNA. If people want to look it up online, it's a, it's a great tool to figure out where do you walk away or how do you find ways to, for consensus, for sufficient consensus right. and negotiation to where there's an area of possible agreement to limit the walk away point. And so there's the BATNA and the ZOPA, the uh, BATNA best alternative to a negotiated agreement and the, uh, or close to that, and then the ZOPA. So if you're listening to this I, and you've never heard those two terms, just Google them and study that a little bit. It's a great tool to have in your back pocket at any given moment in a negotiation. Mm, interesting. But, I know you do work outside the U.S. Uh, talk about kind of board governance, how it, how it differs uh, from the, the U.S. Uh, and I know you've worked in Europe and in mm -hmm. other parts of, of the world. Talk a little bit about that, what you've seen. Well, it's, it's very interesting today um, because the United States, we tend to have a system that evolves more. And what I mean by that, it can be legal precedents. Um, in, in our country, the Delaware Court of Chancery, because a lot of corporations are formed in Delaware for, um, ver for the uh, tax and corporate formation purposes, it's become a, uh, almost like a tradition in this country. 
And under the Court of Chancery, there are essentially three, and these extend to any board member. And it's and and these come out of um, a historical point is is 1992 and a thing called the Cadbury Report out of the United Kingdom. But at the same time, there were things going on in this country. Uh, Bill George, who's now a professor at at, at Harvard, um, was also initiating activities at Medtronic, and other companies were doing this kind of thing about what are the duties of a board, and it's duty of care, duty of monitoring or oversight, and duty of loyalty. And and there's varying other descriptions, but it really comes down to those three. And I think the first one is fascinating to me. And if if you're interested, we if someone's interested listening, the, we wrote a, a short piece, but I think it's I, I hope it's pretty good on the duty of care because it's a fascinating word. The notion of care. Hmm. I mean, think about how much a mother cares for her child. Well, it's similar to way a board member should care for its organization. I mean, there is a familiar type of relationship between the leadership of an organization and an organization. I mean, many, many of the businesses in the world today are started by families, right. uh, mother or father or group. And, um, and therefore, it's interesting, globally, there is a similar, and I use that metaphor because there is a similar context in many of the of the larger companies, I mean, countries of the world, and even China is evolving a bit this direction towards focusing on this responsibility to one, support those three duties and define those well. And then interestingly enough, there, there, I, this started in simultaneous, we had started the Center for Board Excellence um, and there was no one mandated a board assessment. Hmm. In, in late 2010, the, um, the United Kingdom corporate governance code was released and it mandated a board assessment at least every three years um, to be conducted by an outside party. Now, the New York, um, both the New York um, Stock Exchange listing, agree, um, your agreement to be on the New York Stock Exchange and the UK corporate governance code required some sort of board of assessment, but usually that was kind of like an end of the session um, quick, you'd fill it out on one page piece of paper. It wasn't what we consider today to be an assessment of the board, the board's culture, the mission and values, it's, it's, uh, and those three duties that we're talking about. It's much more intensively focused today on, on how do we assess good corporate governance, and that's being done similarly globally. So the countries, particularly that um, the EU for the most part, is uh, is following out of the Cadbury report in '92. Um, many of the countries, United Kingdom, Scandinavian countries, and and what's evolved out of that is the UK. This, I mean, not the UK. I'm sorry, the um, Australia, Canada, and South Africa, all because of their British influence, had followed the uh, the Cadbury court report and the UK code. Um, which was first came out in the early 2000s, and they've the world now today is following a similar set of examples, and uh, and there are other organizations now that have formed over the last several years, um, some under the UN and so on, that are encouraging a more global approach to the the code of conduct for boards of directors, so it's becoming more common. And then that is drifting over to and being augmented in the private world of um, because a lot of larger private companies say, I don't really want to go public because of all the hassle, right. but I want to behave well. And what does well look like and what does well mean? Uh, and that's that's where companies like ourselves are, are trying to help augment that definition. Okay. So you've had a an interesting seat seeing a lot of different organizations uh, and seeing a number of leaders that you've absorbed, uh, observed over the, uh, the mm -hmm. last several years. Uh, looking back on what you've learned uh, in your career, if you're able to go back uh, to a, a 22 year old uh, Byron, what, what advice would you give him 
uh, in your career from what you've observed? What inspires you will probably uh, encourage your career more than the noise around that inspiration. And, uh, and noise can be money. Noise can be popularity. You will eventually achieve some of those if that's your, your career mm. desire. And, and, and I can even, let me make it a local, simple example. Um, I'm in Greensboro, North Carolina. And for example, here, a home builder who does a great job I can think of a few who started out quite simply and they focused on the core elements. And I would say, going back to even the duty concept, they cared a lot. They were monitored. They allowed and invited monitoring or oversight by their customers and they were loyal to their customer base. Mm -hmm. And today they, they are very successful. And some of them, if we follow that in other areas um, and in other businesses, I think we could find examples where people that have done that sort of thing have grown businesses to massive sizes and have solved big problems in the world in an excellent way. And it's, it started with somebody being determined to, f to fulfill that vision that they had for their lives. And that can be a great carpenter on a local basis, or it can be um, developing a pharmaceutical or a device, or in the case of someone like Elon Musk, figuring out how to solve transportation issues so that it doesn't cause massive problems and, and congestion in our world, both from a uh, environmental standpoint and from a logistical standpoint. That's good. Well, what what if you look back on on your career, the importance of mentors and what you've seen with other CEOs? Um, how important is for somebody that's kind of starting out or earlier in their career to have mentors around them? I, I would call a mentor an imperative. Mm -hmm. um, there's, um, I'm, I've been involved with. Uh, probably five key mentors in my life. And, and right off the bat, I can, uh, unfortunately, a few have died, which is always sad. But uh, there's one gentleman that I'm involved with today who, um, who I knew is at 15, and I'm involved in an organization that he is, that's a leadership organization that he founded um, today and, uh, and doing very interesting things in the world. And I wouldn't be where I am today w without those mentors. And my accountability to my vision for life and helping others would not be where it is today without those mentors. And, and I'm, I don't think I would be happy without those mentors. They're reminders. Um, they're that positive voices mm -hmm. that I hear in, in my head, particularly when I'm down or feel like uh, circumstances are difficult. I hear mentors in my life say, you can stick in there. You can overcome this. And, uh, and I think that's an important thing to have those kinds of voices because too many times we've, you know, I think that all of us would resonate. We've got some sort of negative voice telling us why we can't do it. Right. We need to overcome those. And that's a key part of leadership. So, Tell me about uh, just some of the influences outside of mentors, uh, books that you've read that maybe recently or in the past that you would say would be really helpful for a CEO or a board member to uh, to read. Well, a few a, a few that I find um, that I would put on the top, you know, almost imperative or required reading list would be um, I, Good to Great is an is an excellent read. It's um, was. I think he released that in 2005. There's a book by Cynthia Montgomery named The Strategist. It's relatively short and pretty quick read. Um, if you're a private company or a family company, 
then I would suggest Generation to Generation by um, John Davis, a very good uh, book and, and a professor of mine at one point. Um, a couple books that Jay Lorsch has, has written on, uh, on board. He is a specific board expert, and he wrote one back to the drawing board that I would recommend. That leans a little bit more towards the larger public company arena, but um, it's a good read. And then uh, Collins followed up with a book called Great by Choice. And um, and then I, I'm a I'm a big um, fan of some of the Eng, of, of a few English authors, and um, I happen to be a big Tolkien fan. Um, if if one has ever had a hankering to read Lord of the Rings, I think there's lots of leadership and culture lessons all throughout Lord Lord of the Rings. So if you've never read it. Um, it's summertime. That's a that's a good read. Um, so those are a few that uh, I'll cool. throw out that are off the top of my head. I um, I happened to be in, in uh, Oxford, England last week, and I walked by a pub called the Eagle and Child, where a little group of authors named the Inklings used to gather, uh, and uh, they would read read each other's manuscripts. And that's uh, two of those key authors was C.S. Lewis. I'm a big fan of some of his writings and then also um, Tolkien and the, the two of them and some others would, would gather and read their manuscripts there, which is a pretty cool thought. Not a bad idea to have like a small group that you sure. get together with um, regularly and talk about ideas. Mm, good. So outside of work, I think it's always important when I talk to CEOs, it's always interesting to hear what they do outside of their uh, their work and the importance of uh, having some other interests. Uh, tell me a little bit, some of your outside interests. Um, I, um, I'm, I am a, a big reader and I, uh, and I enjoy study. So that's, a, that's just kind of a natural part of what I spend my personal time doing. Uh, in my little office at home, I'm, I'm often in there studying away on fun parts of of literature and and uh, and hi history is a, right now i'm reading robert's book on churchill which is a great read if you um but that's that's a heavy read it's about 1600 pages you've got to be a big <laughs> churchill fan to plow through that one but but um right now mark i am spending a lot of my extra time because i'm delighted to have four wonderful little grandchildren all under the age of five and they live near me. So I'm, um, and, and I, uh, I'm a youth. I, I hope I maintain being a youthful sort of grandpa because I'm, uh, I'm an active outdoors person. I, I ski race. I'm okay. an Alpine wow. in college. I was an Alpine skier. And so I continue to do that. So I look forward to teaching them how to ski. And I, I get out and ski with friends, um, do a lot of hiking, uh, my wife and I do a lot of hiking and I, and that's a, I think that's a great leadership activity because it, it helps us um, experience the benefits of the world that we have around us. And uh, I'm an outdoorsy kind of person though. I do. I'm game for about any kind of sport <laughs> that, uh, that won't quite kill me at this age, but uh, I'll try almost anything that, uh, that tests what I can do today in a sporting area. But uh, play a little golf here and there, but I'm not particularly good. But get out more for the cultural piece to spend an afternoon with uh, four people from time to time is a, is a good thing to do. Good. Well, any parting advice that you, you would give somebody in leadership? Um, I'm, I'm working with our, our team. We, we have um, uh, an ongoing suggestion period, but in our annual reviews, we particularly want uh, members of the team to uh, employees to put in suggestions. And one of the suggestions was to, to develop um, and focus on their strength finders. They all wanted to read strength finders. I'd started doing that on a, um, on a voluntary level for all employees. I, I offered to them that they, that will buy them a copy of strength finders and then take the test and then I'll meet with them. Um, and so they, but what they've wanted to do is a strength finder series of what we call a lunch and learn here at our office. And so um, they've asked me to 
lead that the first few times and then to have others come in and uh, guest speakers, but also some of the employees talk about it. So um, the thing I love about Strength Finders is the simple concept of we can spend our lives working on our our problems or our weaknesses, where if we spend more of our time on our strengths and doing what is good, we've got less time to waste on what is error-filled or weak within us. And so I would encourage, I found it very encouraging to me to kind of rehash. I pulled out and dusted off my, when I first did Strength Finders about nine years ago, and uh, it was fascinating to think through the lens of of um, teaching this in a way with my and walking through this with my employees, and it's a it's a humbling and and yet it's also an encouraging contextual um, activity to look at what what are you good at doing and how are you going to do it to help and frankly I think today we have an unusual opportunity to advance and to do more good for our civilization than ever before in the history of mankind. And uh, kind of going back to the notion that let's all pull together and uh, widen the prosperity base as wide as possible and change civilization together. And I think we do that by encouraging all of our strengths. Good. Well, I sure appreciate uh, your your insights and thoughts today, and this has been a lot of fun. Well, thank you, Mark. I really appreciate you having a podcast like this and encouraging this sort of thing. I hope this is helpful for someone out there. Thank you for listening to the Motivated to Lead podcast. Please subscribe on iTunes. You can also see a video version of this interview at motivatedtolead.com. This podcast is brought to you by SEMA Partners, helping you find your next great leader.